Thank you, Linda, for that introduction. Um, so I'm going to go over these things today, uh, talk a little bit about what we've seen uh, with climate change uh, over the last 50, 100 years, uh, talk a little bit about uh, projections of climate change. I'm going to hammer the concept of uncertainty, as in hammer it in and what it means, what it means to us uh, as land managers. Um, I'm going to talk a, a bit about, uh, in a broad sense, the effects of climate change uh, on forests, what we're seeing, uh, what we're projected to see. And uh, uh, very briefly, I'm going to talk about Forest Service uh, policy uh, and then some general tools uh, for all of you folks to draw upon. So part of the format that I'm going to follow is, uh, is I'm going to organize this according to questions. These are questions that I, I, I get all the time in these talks, but just generally when people find out that uh, you know, I deal with climate change and climate adaptation, these are the questions that I most frequently get and also what I most frequently see out in the you know, in, in general public and in, in news and so on. Is there still a debate about climate change? I don't get that one as much anymore, um, but is there a debate about its causes? I still do get that one quite a bit, and it's a valid question. Let's address that really quickly. Climate change, uh, the international, our intergovernmental panel on climate change just puts out these, uh, these assessment reports um, and in 2013, they began saying that the evidence for climate change is unequivocal, which means there is no doubt. When I saw that for the first time in that report, I had never seen that written in a scientific report before. Um, scientists, pretty much by definition, we doubt everything and we're always going to find doubt and you know, that helps generate the next study. Uh, for this organization of hundreds and hundreds of scientists, vetted through hundreds and hundreds of ultimately government officials to say that climate change, the evidence for climate change is unequivocal, was ground shaking. Uh, now, in 2013, they were saying it's very likely that humans are the main cause since 15, uh, since 1950. In uh, 2018, they upgraded that to extremely likely, uh, which basically means there's very little doubt, less than 5% doubt. Um, that since 1950 were the main cause of climate change. Now, I'll tell you, in climate change circles, people who give these kinds of talks, we always talk about, you know, what do you say? Uh, how do you communicate uh, something that is as difficult as this subject? One thing you hear again and again is, well, don't blame people. Don't talk about the causes. Just talk about what's happening and what we can do about it. And we're going to do a lot of that today. But the causes also matter when you're working on a time scale of, say, 60 years, 100 years, what is the length of the rotations that you're dealing with? What is the time scale that you're working with and you're thinking about? The causes matter because, hey, if this goes away next year, wouldn't that be great? In 10 years, in 15 years, wouldn't that be great? But if the causes are really humans, and if we continue to put out the greenhouse gases that are driving this issue and this change, uh, then you're really looking at longer term change and that needs to factor in your decisions. So causes matter and the future changes then partly depend upon us. Uh, one other aspect of this um, that came out in the 2018 uh, US National Climate Assessment is there's no convincing alternative explanation. So there's lots of alternative explanations. Um, none of them hold water. So it's not like there are lots of things that could be happening and we're saying it's humans and it's climate change. There just isn't any other explanation um, that can even partially explain uh, what we're seeing. All right, here's another way to think about it. Say you're in charge of a bridge and your chief engineer comes to you and says, you know what, I think this bridge is gonna fail and I think the reason it's going to fail is because of the materials that you've been using to, in the upkeep of this bridge, to keep this bridge uh, working. So what are you going to do at that point? You're going to fire the engineer because who wants to hear that nonsense? So you got another engineer. And this other engineer comes and says to you, you know what? Yeah, I'm a little worried about the bridge. I know what happened to my predecessor, but I got to tell you, it's probably you. So what are you going to do? That one's gone too. Now, imagine you have 97 engineers 
that come and tell you basically that same thing. There's variations, but basically the same thing. And you got one who you want to keep that says, you know what? Yeah, OK, the bridge has got some problems, but probably not your fault. It'll probably fix itself. It'll be all right. Now, you can believe this one, because who wouldn't, right? But you can't ignore the 97. Or that is to say that if you ignore the 97, are you actually committing a breach of trust? And so if you are working in the public trust, you can believe whatever you want. But a practical assessment of risk is what you need to act on. And that's the 97. In a lot of ways, what I say sometimes to folks when I get to, when I'm dealing with professionals, is belief is a luxury. It's a luxury for people who are making decisions that don't have long-term consequences. And for a lot of people who are working in the public trust and who are making decisions, and those decisions have consequences, it's most prudent and responsible to act on that basis of facts and risk. So of course you knew where I was going with this, right? So 97 out of 100 climate scientists are saying not only is the climate change in, but it's greenhouse gases that are the primary driver of climate change. So is there still a debate? There's no debate on if. There is some debate uh, really on uh, how much, how fast feedback mechanisms. And I'll go through some of that stuff. So think about risk and move away from belief. All right, I get this one a lot. Is it climate change or global warming? And you hear both terms. They seem to maybe be the same. They maybe are different. You're not quite sure. Maybe it's a big scam. All right. So here we have the temperature anomaly over the past 120 years. And you see a general increase, especially over the last 50 years. This little flat-ish spot in here was the so-called climate pause when if you look at it just right, which is kind of fun, you can draw a downward line. And so some people were starting to talk about climate cooling. That was fun. Um, so you, you saw that that ended. Uh, so over uh, the last 50 years especially, but 100 or so years, what we've seen is a general trend toward war warming. And that trend is increasing. So it's getting warmer faster. So globally, on average, it's warming. That's global warming. Now, when you look at the United States um, and you look at temperature change in Fahrenheit um, for this period relative to this period, uh, what you see is that it hasn't warmed the same amount everywhere. And in some places, like in the southeast, you have the so-called warming hole, which is, means it's actually cooled there. Right? So when you talk about climate change, what you see is that warming that is a global average is actually distributed variably. So it's not a constant change. Now, if you look at um, precipitation, you see the same basic thing. On average, most places in the world are getting more precipitation than they were. That's a part of climate change. But some places are getting a lot less. Some places are getting way more. Some places are getting just slightly more. And we'll talk about seasonality a little bit later. So again, global warming, but climate change. Uh, another thing we're seeing is the way that that uh, precipitation, for example, is distributed. And that more often, it comes in bigger events. So even where we're getting more annual precipitation, more of that precipitation is coming in big one or two day rain events so that you have less of that precipitation distributed um, in ways that the system can more easily capture. So a lot of the rain nowadays hits and leaves, maybe takes some soil with it. Another thing we're seeing uh, is longer growing seasons, which is good in some ways and bad in others. And I'll talk about that. We're seeing that in most places. So the frost-free <coughs> frost season uh, is lengthening, and, but not the same everywhere. Again, global warming causing climate change. So is it global warming or is it climate change? It's both. Uh, over the last 115 years, we've seen 100, 
oh, our 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature globally. In the US, in the last 30 years, it's been just over one degree of Fahrenheit of temperature increase. And I mentioned uh, that we're seeing these changes in precipitation with big events. So ultimately, the, the Earth has warmed, the country has warmed, um, and that is driving changes in climate, what we think of as long-term weather patterns and variability. Is that 1.2 degrees, is that an average for the entire year? Is that peaks? That is an average for, um, that's a good question. It's one, the 1.2 degrees is an average for a 30-year period, which I think was the, um, uh, was this same 30-year period of uh, 1986 to 2016 relative to this 40-year um, period of, or 60-year period of 1901 to 1960. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, that's another piece. So one way to think about it, weather, that's what you're wearing right now. It's a warm day. Uh, climate, that's what's in your closet. Climate is uh, the long-term um, average and, uh, and, and variability. Um, you know, weather is short term uh, uh, this year, that year. Okay. Question you, here, if you, don't mind. you bet. How do we know what the average temperature was 115 years ago? Um, we, well, 115 years ago was easy. Um, people were measuring it uh, 115 years ago. Um, and so, uh, so people have been measuring temperature for a while, and so that's why when you see that graph, it only goes back 115 years, because we have actual measurements um, in lots of different places um, going back that far. Um, and I'm gonna come back to your question in a few slides when we talk about thousands of years. All right, um, so we've gotten this far, um, and people say, all right, I get it, maybe some things are changing a bit, um, but I, I still struggle with how you can change something as massive as the atmosphere. I get this question in lots of different ways. This is just the way I phrased it here. But still just the sense of, my god, the Earth is huge. The atmosphere is enormous. Um, how can we possibly change it? How can it possibly be us? It must just be something natural. Totally reasonable. Um, so. Let's think about the, the, the carbon cycle and inputs into the atmosphere. Um, we have uh, this geological reservoir, which is massive. And um, in the period of, of, of 2004 to 2013, we put in uh, not quite nine gigatons, so nine billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere from that reservoir, which had been trapped underground for millions of years and, and hadn't been touched. Now, um, in that time, we also uh, did a bunch of land use change, uh, mostly in the southern hemisphere, and we put not quite a gigaton of carbon in the atmosphere from that. That carbon had been cycling. That's part of the, the carbon cycle that has been around since humans have been around. <coughs> Uh, now, forests um, and other uh, vegetation um, have taken up uh, a bunch of, the, of that carbon that went into the atmosphere, not quite three gigatons, went into forests and soils. And then, again, uh, about two and a half gigatons went into the ocean, mostly abiotically. Uh, that leaves not quite four and a half gigatons in the atmosphere. So we do have sinks in the ocean and the um, terrestrial biosphere, but we're putting out more carbon than those sinks are taking up. So we're leaving more carbon in the atmosphere than was there before. And when I say more than was there before, that's super important because this has been underground for millions of years. So when we add it to the atmosphere, it's a net addition it wasn't effectively a part of the carbon cycle since humans have existed. So it's a net addition to the atmosphere. If you think about it in another way, I like these bubble graphs here. 
This is the, that was fluxes of carbon. These are stocks of carbon. So you've got um, the ocean, which is where um, you've got 37 gigatons of car 37,000 gigatons of carbon, massive storage of carbon, but most of that cycles on hundreds and thousands of years. It's deep. Um, at the surface, you've got maybe 900 gigatons. That cycles more annually or decadally. Now, you've got in soils and vegetation, again, a massive amount, over 2,000 gigatons, and permafrost, like maybe 1,600 gigatons. So again, these massive amounts. And the atmosphere is actually smaller than all of these. So 839 gigatons, which was actually a smaller number when I first started giving this talk. It's, it's measurably increased. Um, now, what we've put into this system in terms of a net addition, cumulatively, is 385 gigatons. So it's not some infinitesimal dot, right? When you look at it in the scale of these other stocks, it's a noticeable amount. That's what we've actually added to the system, and it's a net addition. And that net addition matters, and it doesn't have to be the very biggest. Sometimes when you've got just the right amount, adding just a little bit more, like that maybe second or third piece of pumpkin pie, Thanksgiving. It's not a big piece. You're just going to cut the sliver. It's your third. But it just pushes you over the edge into, edge into outright pain and regret. Like, that's, that, is, that is this net addition here. All right. So. The atmosphere is massive. How can we change it? We change it by adding this massive amount of carbon into it that is a net addition. Um, we can measure this stuff. We have been measuring this stuff. That's how we know that this is happening. OK. That gets us to this part. All right, all right. We're changing things. But they've always changed. And even if I'm convinced, which I might not be, that this change is human caused, Change is natural. This might, could be a natural change. And so why should we be worried about this change? OK, let's look at the past change. Change in the past has happened through these Milankovitch cycles. It's the way that the Earth orbits the sun. And it does these little wobbles. It does changes in the eccentricity uh, of its orbit. Um, and these happen on these big scales of 100,000, 40,000, 25,000 years. Now, as this has happened, you can see this in the ice core record. And this gets back to your question earlier. Um, what they are able to do is, is core down literally a kilometer into ice cores. And then they look at isotopes of the gas uh, in those ice cores. And what they know empirically is that you have different proportions of those isotopes um, that are in air at different temperatures. And so while this says change in temperature, um, just to make it simple, in fact, these are what are called proxy temperatures based upon, they weren't directly measured, they're inferred from relationships between these different isotopes. I don't often get to talk about this. It's really fun. But anyway, thank you for asking that question. Uh, so now what we've seen, you see these, these, uh, uh, these um, patterns that I had just mentioned caused by the Milankovitch cycles. And basically what you see here are, um, are the big ice ages, right? Now in blue, you've got temperature. And so you have these massive temperature changes. And um, these were caused by the way the Earth orbits the sun. Now what you see then in yellow, Gerber yellow, is uh, changes then in um, carbon dioxide that actually follow the temperature changes. So in the past, what happened, Earth orbits the sun just a little differently. It might uh, cause some cooler temperature. The biosphere and the oceans respond, and they amplify the trend caused by Earth's orbit. So it starts getting cooler. There's amplification, and then it gets cooler faster. That's what you're seeing here. And then the orbit changes again, starts getting warmer, the system responds, and it starts getting warmer faster. That's the way that it's always worked before. 
CO2 is a big part of that. Um, and uh, the CO2 is a, and, and other greenhouse gases were always a major part of that amplification. Um, but one thing that we see, so right here, so uh, human, Homo sapiens emerged around here, just to give some um, context. This is civilization right in here. Um, and, and in this CO2, what you see is this big jump um, being caused by uh, the Industrial Revolution. And so at this point right now, we've got more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's this net addition that I was just talking about, than we've had in millions of years, at least a few million years, but certainly way before humans existed. So let's talk about the greenhouse effect and why that matters. You guys have all heard about the greenhouse effect. Everybody has at this point. Um, but basically, the idea is you got the sun, most of the energy that we um, really enjoy, the warmth uh, on Earth comes from the greenhouse effect in that it comes from the sun, ultimately. So the sun sends its wonderful rays to Earth. Uh, about half bounce off of the Earth or clouds. Um, some is absorbed by the Earth and it's re-radiated um, and, uh, and then or bounces off the Earth. Some of it is re-radiated. Um, as long wave radiation. That long wave radiation is captured by greenhouse gases. That's what makes them greenhouse gases. Gases. So they let the short wave radiation, which is sunlight through, but they capture the long wave radiation um, coming off of the earth um, and then re-radiate it wherever they are. That's, that's the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect actually is super cool because without the greenhouse effect, earth would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit, a frozen ball of ice. With the greenhouse effect, I gotta update this. It's, it's warmer now than 57, but on average, it's about 57 degrees, which for me is a very comfortable temperature. Um, so greenhouse effect really is a pretty good thing. Um, now, when we talk about the greenhouse gases, we mostly hear about CO2 because that's the most abundant of the grass gases. It's not the strongest of the greenhouse gases, but it's the most abundant. And so it has the largest effect given how much there is. But what I told you actually was just misleading. It's the most abundant of the anthropogenic gases. Now, water vapor is actually the most abundant of the greenhouse gases. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas. And, um, and does capture heat and does hold heat. But there's a key difference here in that when we put out carbon dioxide, especially this net addition, it's going to stay in the atmosphere hundreds of years. That's its lifetime in the atmosphere, hundreds of years. Water vapor is driven by heat. So when we actually make it warmer, there's more water vapor. So it's kind of a double whammy. But water vapor only stays in the atmosphere for days on average, right? So it comes and goes. And so if, if we can reduce the heat, then we lose more water vapor and it can get cooler. So you mostly hear about CO2 um, because of that longer lasting effect that we're having driving it, whereas water vapor is actually being driven by the CO2 and the heat that the CO2 creates. Make sense? So, hasn't the climate always changed? It has, but in the past, the climate change has mostly been driven by Earth's orbit. And it's worked on, on these cycles of 100,000 years, of 40,000 years, of 10,000 years, even the wiggles that you were looking at. Those are 10,000 year wiggles, right? Um, that perturbation, that's 10,000 year perturbation. Right now, we are driving change fast. And we're driving change fast because of all of the CO2 that we're pumping in the atmosphere. More, more than we've seen for millions of years. And why does that matter? It matters because um, we rely on systems as they are. We have infrastructure, demographics, cities are where they are, agriculture is where it is, forests are where they are, the infrastructure and supply chains built around all of those things are where they are because largely of where climate is or what climate is where it is and we're changing that. That's why we care. All right, 
what about the future? Isn't it uncertain? And I don't trust climate models is another version of that. I get that one a lot. I don't trust climate models either, just so you know, and neither should you. OK, let's talk about uncertainty. You can think about a few types of uncertainty. There's internal variability, scenario uncertainty, which I'll talk about at length, and scientific uncertainty. Now, uncertainty in general just gets higher as you go out. Um, but at any given point, if you look at the, uh, the relative amount of these three types of uncertainty, in the near term, everything is driven by randomness. That's the internal variability. When you talk to meteorologists, sometimes they're the most dubious about climate change. That's less true than it used to be. But part of that is because they're always talking about forecasts a couple weeks out. And they're like, I can't forecast anything two months out. How can you forecast climate 100 years out? Well, in the near term, it's all about internal variability. It's about randomness. That's driving the system. And so um, how much CO2 we're putting out right now um, is not a, a, a big factor of uncertainty um, as it is later on. And then we understand the system pretty decently. But again, much of what we understand about weather is trumped by just the randomness of weather. So that's what that describes in the near term. But as you go out, you see that these things change. And the short term randomness becomes less important. Um, what we know and understand about the climate system and its feedbacks with the Earth-wide system becomes more important. But what becomes critically important is what I've just been talking about at length, which is how much CO2 we put out. And that's why I say that it matters that we have an effect. Because depending on if we put out very little or a lot, uh, we can have a huge effect on what the climate does 100 years from now. So when I talk about scenarios, when we look out into the future, we can't know how much CO2 we are going to put out. So that is built-in uncertainty. That's not going to change. We're never going to know. So we will always have that uncertainty. So looking into the future, we will never have a certain climate future. We won't know exactly what the climate's going to be because we can't know how much CO2 we're going to be putting out over the next decades. That's the reality that we have to deal with. What we do then when we try to project into the future is we come up with these scenarios. They're basically storylines about how society will deal with, put, with, with growth, with population growth, with industrial growth, with technological growth, uh, agricultural growth, and how that then also will relate to greenhouse gas emissions. In the past, um, they went in the direction with uh, with these scenarios, which you've all heard of, B1, B2, A2, so on, um, they, it was a story driven. Um, more recently, what they've done with the representative concentration pathways, RCPs, is they look at um, basically the change at the tropopause, the, the change at a piece of the atmosphere and the, the increase in, in the wattage or the heat. And so, and then they drive backwards to say, well, what, what, what is a story that would get us to this change of 8.5 or 4.5, for example? But you can see that basically um, A2 and 8.5 match up, and, um, and 4.5 matches up with B1. So these are mostly what people use as A1FI or A2, and then B1 and 4.5. I needed to say that. You guys need to know it. You got the graph in your notes. Um, but we can move on. Uh, so I also needed to cover that because when I want to talk about feedbacks and I want to talk about uncertainty, there's two critical sources of uncertainty um, that I showed you in that first colorful graph, uh, scenario uncertainty and scientific uncertainty. So scenario uncertainty I just talked about. Now, when we feed that into models, you got that range then of greenhouse gases that you're basically feeding into models based on these storylines you've created or based on the change that you want to see in the tropopause. <coughs> so then in the models, you have concentrations of radi radiac, you have concentrations of greenhouse gases. I can't say that word. And the concentrations of greenhouse gases cause radiative forcing, so warming. So the concentrations of greenhouse gases causes warming in the models. 
And then the warming causes the climate response. Remember the bit, is it climate change or is it global warming? That's that bit right there. Now, the climate response creates feedbacks with the carbon cycle. And then based upon what those feedbacks are, that can change the concentrations of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and then it loops. Feedbacks are critically important. So we've got this bit about a scenario uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know in terms what's going to happen in terms of how much emissions we're going to see, what the policies are going to be, what the technology is going to be, what people are going to do. And then we've got scientific uncertainty of how does it all fit together? Some models will have, uh, they'll describe a different warming associated with a certain amount of CO2 that's put in or other greenhouse gas. Or they'll describe a certain amount of warming and then a, a different kind of climate response. So that's the, that is the range that you'll see that's in models. Uh, now, when we look at temperature and we use a bunch of these different models, in the black line what you see uh, is what actually has been uh, um, well, all the, the average of all of these uh, hundreds of runs of models. And in red, uh, that is actual measured um, climate temperature over time. And so you can see that when they're fed the correct, the actual um, CO2, that they actually um, match what was measured pretty well. So the models work reasonably well for temperature. I will say much, much, much less well for precipitation. But, uh, but you got to know what's going to happen. Now, let me talk about certainty. Again, some more in terms of um, uh, the mythological sense that we have certainty. Um, this is uh, the Sandy Track. Now, when we were talking at this point about uh, Hurricane Sandy hitting the East Coast, um, we had dozens of models modeling where it was going to hit. Um, so there was no certainty where it was going to hit. Now, if you were a city manager, you could say, and your city was maybe right here, you could say, you know what? I like this model. <laughs> uh huh. Um, again, you're working in the public trust, and when Sandy hits maybe here, and you still get the t you still get a big you still get a big punch, you know you might not have a job uh, in the coming months. So we're used to dealing with uncertainty, and in fact, the cities that were in that range prepared, and the ones that didn't suffered for not preparing, and that's that practical assessment of risk and then acting upon it, even if you really wanted to believe in this model. So when we look at this idea again of model sensitivity, you see this range from the sensitivity of the model to the CO2 we put in. You see this range here of future emissions that we might create depending on whether it's say B1 or A2 or RCP 4.5 or RCP 8.5. And you get this range of plausible climate futures, or plausible future climates. Now, you can pick this range, because it looks the best, but if you're here, your system might fail. You can pick this range because you're a pessimist, and you can make a ton of choices based upon that range, but in fact, then there's some technological and policy advances, and we end up somewhere over here. And you, in, in, in the meantime, made a bunch of changes that basically forestalled choices that your, the next generation of civil cultures would have, right? So the question then becomes, how does the ecosystem that you are managing fare across this entire range? To the extent that it may fail with just a little bit of change, you've got more risk to the extent that it may do all right across much of this range, you've got less risk. And then the question becomes, what are the choices you're making? Are the choices that you make going to help that system do better across the whole range, or are they gonna limit it within a certain part of the range? 
simpler way to do that, and think about this, insensitive model, so not that much climate change for a certain amount of CO2, with low emissions, sensitive model, more response uh, for the emissions, and uh, you get more projected change. Just look at that range. Just think about that range. This is the sledgehammer approach to sensitivity analysis. How is your system going to do across that range? And then critically, what is your risk tolerance? If your system is going to fail early in this range, but it is a critical system to you for some reason, maybe because you've got an endangered species in there, maybe because it's a super high value, um, super high value uh, set of species in there, economically or culturally, what actions might you take to try to forestall change in that system, even though you know that ultimately the whole system may fail? Likewise, if you see that system, if you think it's going to fail early on, what changes might you begin to make to ensure that it can be more robust across the whole range? And then if you've got systems that you think are going to do all right, you know, maybe you don't have to work on changing those as much. Right? Makes sense? So one thing to think about these climate models, they're not made to predict weather. And they're not made to predict climate in a certain year, 10 years from now. They're made to understand relationships and trends that occur across multiple decades. And they do that pretty well with temperature, less well with precip. But don't use them as a prediction tool. Use them as a tool to understand these ranges that you can work with to make decisions that are within your own toolbox. So key question then, what is all this going to mean for forests? I'm going to talk about a, a bunch of different aspects, a bunch of different ideas and stressors. But this is, again, the wide national talk. You guys each work in a place, and you will or already know that place better than just about anybody else. And the effect of disturbance, including disturbance that you introduce uh, on that place. So what I say becomes sort of this general blanket, but you got to figure out the specifics. All right, if you're going to think about a few things of effects on forests, a good way to bend them, thanks to Maria, I stole this from her, is, uh, is shifting seasons is one thing that we're all seeing already and we will continue to see. Another is shifting species. That's what we're just beginning to see in the last 20 years, but we're going to continue to see more of. And shifting stressors. And then I'll talk about that more. And that can be a real game changer. So if we think about shifting seasons, one thing that we're seeing all over the place are longer growing seasons, and we will continue to see those. And what's more is that they're going to get much longer. And and this is a lower emissions B1, higher emissions A2 in the United States. You can see that in some places, um, they're going to get much longer, um, up to 10 weeks longer. Right? So what does that mean for the system? And if you're all about uh, biomass production, that can be great. Um, but understand that it's also going to um, create these phenological mismatches. When do the trees flower? Um, when, do the when are the insects there to pollinate? Is there now a mismatch? If you have bird species coming through, are the insects there at the right time anymore? Um, so there are all, all kinds of uh, system drivers or system uh, connections that may be just a little bit offset. And frankly, nobody quite knows how much effect that's going to have all over the place. And you might have a better idea in your place than anybody else. And that's something to start thinking about and paying attention to. Uh, another, and I'll talk about, say, invasives, but another here is that with this longer um, growing season, um, you have different competitive relationships. Some things can take advantage, whether they're plant species, animal species, insect species, of those longer growing seasons more than others. And as they can, the, uh, the, the, the competitive relationships between those different species changes. Some of that has to do with phenology. All right, 
shorter, warmer winters. Um, so we're already seeing uh, decreases in snowfall and in snowpack. And in some areas, that's a really big deal um, because of the longer term um, hydrological consequences uh, in, in a given year. Um, in other places, that is also all about um, when they harvest. And so uh, as well, uh, in terms of hydrology, that more rain on snow. So it's a little warmer, so you maybe have less snow, less snow pack, less frozen ground, but you also end up getting more rain on that snow, which isn't then stored in the system for recharge uh, of the system in the spring and available to the plants when they need it. Good question, Jamie. So uh, the question, if, if you couldn't hear it, was um, maybe the shifts uh, in weather patterns are going to cause winters to be more harsh. And yes, I will say that this is an active area of debate. But a lot of the climate community seems to be agreeing that that can be the case. And you've all heard of the polar vortex. Um, I have to do the jazz hands when I do polar vortex because it's <laughs> There's, there's something that's called the polar cell, and that's a weather cell that is on uh, the pole. And, it's, and it's, um, it's basically trapped by the jet stream. It's like a top that's spinning and trapped in place uh, really fast. And, and, and like a top, if you bump it, it'll wobble. And so what happens when um, the temperature difference between the polar cell and the God, Hadley cell right beneath it um, is similar, uh, less different, the jet stream drops. And that's like bumping the top, and then the top starts to wobble. And that polar cell drops down to where we live, at least if we're in the northern states, but sometimes all the way down into some of the southern states, and it gets cold as hell. Um, now, in that same time, in that same season, the global temperature may still be setting records for high temperatures. but we're just getting this polar cell, which is always cold, but now a little less cold than it was, um, down into where we live. And we're feeling like we're super cold. Does that make sense? And that's, and that's I think, what you were talking about. Yeah, so that's something that we're seeing more of. It's projected to happen more often and maybe will become common. Um, but it's, that's still something that I think people are debating. Yeah. Um, so the question is, is this where we get precip in the wrong times, including frozen rain and, and rain during the winter? Um, uh, that can interact with that, but um, uh, I would say that right now, we're getting that everywhere, all the time. We're getting changes with rain patterns, and we're getting, when we thought we should be getting snow at a certain time of year, now we're getting rain, I mean, it might be just cold rain, um, where we thought, uh, we should be getting rain. Sometimes we're getting snow because we've got the polar vortex, ah, the polar cell dropping down. Um, so it's a lot of that is just the the system changing in ways that we can't predict in a given year. Does that make sense? Shifting hydrology. All right. So the key. So I, I already talked about a bunch of these things: more frequent, intense precip, more rain, reduced snowpack. A lot of this can cause flooding uh, locally. Um, when we're seeing more and more flooding, even in the south where we have the warming hole, we're, we're not seeing uh, increased uh, upper temperatures. We are seeing increased lower temperatures. And we're also seeing increased flooding uh, um, based, uh, compared to what we've seen in the past. Um, and we're also seeing uh, vapor pressure decreases, uh, which creates drier air, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so, the normal seasons are changing. That gets back to your, uh, your question, Casey. So that changes all of these things, quality, quantity of water, groundwater, um, where it is, how much you have available, and at what times a year, um, and the growing conditions, habitat quality, both in water for fish species, out of water for uh, species that rely in some way on riparian systems. OK? Um, so let's talk about shifting species. Um, 
so clearly eco, uh, ecosystems are responding, uh, species are responding, um, and uh, we see greater uh, responses in um, habitat uh, suitability projections in higher, scenario, higher emission scenarios than lower emission scenarios, which is what you'd expect. Um, I'm not going to get into this because because uh, somebody's trying to kick me off stage, uh, but let's just see that even for say that even for uh, something like loblolly pine, which is super established within its range uh, in a higher scenario, even though it's a species that can do pretty well with high temperatures and and dry, um, it's uh, it's projected to lose a lot of its habitat quality. Okay. Um, now, when you see these models, like I just showed you. Be super careful because uh, when they're niche models, they're talking about habitat suitability. They're not talking about where the species will actually be. Um, so they may show a decrease in habitat suitability into the future. That doesn't mean that everything is going to die, especially if it doesn't have a competitor. Uh, it doesn't mean there's going to be this huge, uh, this huge dieback, but it, it does mean that, again, the competitive relationships may change. If there's something that can't outcompete it, it may just not grow as well because it's outside its ideal suitable habitat, but it may do all right. Um, but it's just something that should be a heads up for you to think about um, this species is now or projected to lose its, its suitable habitat where it is. And so it, it, it may be more susceptible to stress later on. Uh, so shifting stressors. I already showed this slide on purpose. One thing about shifting stressors. What is a driver in a system right now, when you get precipitation, how you get precipitation, how much this precipitation you get, that can become a stressor if you just tweak it a little bit. In the same species that love that springtime rain, um, when they get just a little more, suddenly it's a stressor. And another species actually can do really well with that extra springtime rain um, that we're getting and can become more competitive, and then you can see the whole system begin to respond because of that. Okay? So all of the same basic ideas when this was shifting seasons, but depending on the change and how it's laid out, this can become now a stressor. Extreme weather, I don't need to get into this too much. This is self-evident. What I will say is that these aren't really modeled for the most part. So this is something that when you hear about models, um, and what they project for forests, like what I showed with um, that niche model a moment ago, the tree atlas, um, it's not projecting these events. And these events can be real game changers. Drier conditions and drought. Um, all right. So I know I keep going on and on about all this extra rain we're getting. And then we're getting it in big events. And so then what the hell? Now I'm talking about drought. So, the key here is vapor pressure deficit. Yes, I'm going to talk about vapor pressure. I can do this. Who has heard about vapor pressure deficit? One, hot damn. That's one more than last year. Good job. Are you, you do fire? I have a little bit. Yep. So vapor pressure deficit, OK, OK. Imagine you've got a pint glass on the table. It's half full, OK, and you've got a big pitcher, and that's half full. All right? Who's heard of relative humidity? I hate relative humidity. All right? So they're both half full, the pint glass and the pitcher. Say that's like 50% full, 50% of the total, 50% relative humidity. But one is way bigger than the other, right? Say you have your own pint glass, and it's full. And some cruel person, me, comes to you and says, all right, you're going to have to pour your pint glass into either the half full pint glass or the half full pitcher until either the container's full or your glass is empty. Which one are you going to pick? Pitcher. And you don't get to have anything out of the pitcher? Pint glass. Pint glass. Why the pint glass then? Because you keep half your pint. All right? So that is the idea, basically. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I see your face. I'm getting there. Um, so warmer air holds more water. 
it can hold more water, but if it isn't full, it's going to be drawing more water. And so if your full pint glass is the plant, and you've got to choose between the half full pint glass and the half full giant pitcher, you want the pint glass so that you can keep some for yourself. Because if it's a giant pitcher, which is a hot, dry day, it's going to be sucking the life out of you. And they can both be at 50% relative humidity. But the higher vapor pressure deficit is that bigger amount that needs to be filled. Make a little bit of sense? Now, where this gets into a lot of your lives and why I asked you about fires, a lot of the time, oh, OK, I'll get to the next slide. All right, so this gets to warmer temperatures drive moisture deficits. So in other words, the warmer air holds more moisture. It creates more of a vapor pressure deficit. And so it draws more moisture out of the plant and then creates a deficit. And when you look at the temperature change, precip change, drought duration, and then this is critical and something we've been thinking more about with climate change, drought intensity, which is that much higher vapor pressure deficit, what we're seeing in time is that we can still get more rain annually, and it can come in bigger events, but we can get these micro droughts that are super intense and have high vapor pressure deficit, that big pitcher sucking everything out of your pint glass, and then we get mortality, because some trees just can't handle that, even if it's a short duration. Um, that's an increasing area of science. People are figuring that out. Um, but there's some question as to just how much trees can handle. And that does get to fire, because one of the things that when people are talking about fire behavior, they'll talk about fuel aridity, how dry the fuel is. And part of that calculation is the vapor pressure deficit. So you have a wet towel. It's in the shade. Is it going to dry faster on a cold day or a hot day? Right? It's a hot day. That's vapor pressure deficit. That's where you get the fuel aridity, or you can think of this as the towel aridity. So one thing we've seen is longer growing seasons. We've seen longer than fire seasons. And then with increasing vapor pressure deficit, drier air, we've seen increasing fire weather, um, stronger fire weather. Um, this, of course, interacts with pest management. This would be, we would get, be getting more fires anyway, but this is being amplified um, by climate change. And one of the things that we're seeing is in red, in the last 15 years or so, we're seeing more big fires. And that's because of increased fire aridity. That's because of drier air, which is higher vapor pressure deficit. That's going to continue, and it's going to get worse. Pest and disease ranges, they're moving northward. They're moving upward. We don't get as cold as we used to. We're setting lots of high temperature records. We're setting very few low temperature records um, globally anymore and in most places. In some cases, when we get the polar vortex, we'll set one for a couple days. Um, but it's usually not low enough or in the right place to kill um, the pests. It needs to last a little longer. So a lot of the pests are able to get across mountain ranges that they could never get across before because it's not as cold. Uh, in those ranges. So I think you all get that. I don't need to go much more into it. Uh, and then uh, invasive plants, same thing. I talked a lot about the competitive relationships. I'll just say about invasive plants, um, you know, what are they? They're usually early seral species. They come in, they love disturbance, um, they grow fast, maybe they don't last long, maybe they create increased fire danger because they don't last late into the season. Um, Invasive species, what we think of as weeds, seem to love elevated CO2. Not all plants can deal with or take advantage of elevated CO2 as well as others, but uh, the invasives seem to do better with elevated CO2 than most other species. Um, so they will grow faster and more. I think you get that sea level rise. This is another one. Not all of you are on coast, coast and have coastal forests. Since 93, which some of us can remember clearly, uh, at least parts of it, um, we've had three inches of sea level rise. Like, not that long ago, within the last 25 years, we've already had three inches of sea level rise. We're looking at the next 10 years, we're going to get another six inches. This is happening, and it's happening fast. Uh, within a century, 
Um, we're going to get another one to four feet. It will probably be on the upper end of it. If there's another thing besides precip that the global models have done poorly, it's the degradation of the ice sheets. They have all um, underestimated the rate of degradation of the ice sheets, and those are what are driving um, the, uh, besides heat and volume, are what are driving the, uh, the rise in the oceans. <clears throat> all right. So the thing is, is that all these things work together. And you, you, you start with one that a system is susceptible to, even if it's not the others, and suddenly it can become susceptible to the interactions with the others. I think all of you understand that concept. And it's this idea of climate change amplifying existing stressors, and maybe in some cases introducing new ones like invasives or pests um, that is the, the real kicker in this. Um, so it's those interactions to think about and be wary of. And again, you in the places you work will understand those better than anybody. All right, I got, this is super quick. Um, I really, no, it is, I swear. Uh, has anybody read the strategic plan for the Forest Service? <laughs> I'll tell you, for strategic plans, uh, it's not all that bad, um, which is something maybe in college I never imagined myself saying. But I'll say that, uh, so the first goal is what you would expect. Um, the, second, the first objective of the first goal is foster resilient. Has, that word has to always be in there. Adaptive ecosystems to mitigate climate change. So how does Forest Service policy uh, deal with climate change? The first objective of the first goal names it explicitly. Um, the second is to mitigate fire risk, uh, wildfire risk, which is, uh, of course, in, you know, intimately connected, as I just described. We have a national roadmap for responding to climate change. This created the Forest Service Performance Scorecard, which many of you will have heard about. That sunsetted a year or so ago. Um, and a new version of it has been created and is now being piloted. This year will be the first year it's piloted in um, R6 and R9, Pacific Northwest and uh, Eastern regions. <clears throat> so maybe the year after, in a couple years, uh, we'll have a new version. Hopefully it will be viable. Where can I help find tools? I'll just go through these for the next 15 minutes or so. Okay, I won't. I just wrote them down, obviously, so that you can have access to them. I'll point out a couple. Climate Change Resource Center, created by the Forest Service, basically for you. So that is a place where you can go. It's literally, if you're writing documents, copy and paste text straight out of there. Um, mine it for references. Mine it for um, anything you want. If you don't see what you want in there, um, go to the bottom and it says contact us. Contact us. Ask for it. We'll find a way to get what you want in there. Or, or make sure that you get it in some way. Um, and then uh, forestadaptation.org um, is NIAX's website. There's a lot of, of information there. Workbook, adaptationworkbook.org. You'll be using the paper version of that today and adaptationpartners.org out west um, have a ton of information. All right, concluding thoughts. Um, climate is changing. It's going to continue to change. In your careers, the climate will continue to change. It's not going to start backtracking. All the changes that I talked about, they will be happening in places that you work. Uncertainty is the new certainty. Um, previous generations of civil culturists they had this idea that the climate was static with variation, and they built their prescriptions around that. They figured the forests are where they are because of that. That's not true anymore. That's changing. Yours is, are some of the first generations of new civil culturists that are entering your profession knowing that the climate is uncertain and the forests that you have are going to change, in some cases, drastically, potentially within your careers. So you have this new both burden of responsibility to deal with that, but also charge of creativity to deal with that. So good and bad, but it's yours. It's the job. It's your profession. Uh, which comes to there's no shiny new tool. There's going to be nobody giving you the answer. There are some thought leaders. Linda Nagel is one of them um, but uh, in civil culture, but you are going to be the ones figuring this out. Again, you're one of the first generations. 
to really deal with this on the ground level from the start. So you are the ones who will be creating the new ways of coping and thinking about civil culture in an era of climate change. Nobody's going to just give you the answer. So is that sobering? It's maybe a little bit sobering. Um, but I'll tell you something. Um, uh, I have confidence because I've seen you guys year after year um, work with this. And we work with people all over the country. Um, and what we're going to do for the rest of the day is start thinking about what does that look like, thinking about this change and thinking about um, working in these systems as you're thinking about the change. And you'll see I don't think it's so bad. All right, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.